But something I've done in the past that people have enjoyed is just an intro to woodworking. And so the idea behind this quote unquote class is just to cover the basics of what, like how, how one goes about woodworking and thinking about working with wood. Um, it's sort of like a, a lower barrier to entry material to work with than say metal. Most of the time you can, you can work with equipment that's a little less intense and expensive and scary and dangerous. Um, so there's some appeal there, but it's, it's also in some ways harder to work with than metal in my mind. It's a very organic material with humidity and temperature. It, it changes dimensions. Um, there's grain, there's all sorts of weird properties that make it a little more interesting to work with. I'm also trying to figure out where to look. It's a little disconcerting to figure that one out. Um, so yeah, so we're just going to try to cover the basics. And if people have questions, we want to go deeper into details. I've, I've got nowhere to be, so feel free to post them. Um, cool. So yeah, I would say some, like a, a common misconception I think is that the like the the easiest place to start in woodworking is with hand tools and work up from there um i actually think that hand woodworking is much more difficult than using power tools the that's sort of the, it's the traditional way of doing it and it's very respectable because it takes a lot of skill and time and energy uh it, to become a, a quote unquote cabinet maker requires apprenticeships and schooling and that's it's it's pretty involved versus just you know being able to make things uh, with the power tool really quickly. So hand tools is a, is a whole beast into itself. I definitely encourage people to get into it. It's really rewarding. It might be something that you could do at home more easily than using power tools, but it it you put a lot of sweat equity into your work. It's definitely, it requires a lot of, uh, a lot of sweat and frustration um, versus just, you know, chopping with a chop saw, going at it with a saw for a while, that'll, uh, it'll teach you patience. So I would say that, that um, in my mind, that's not the best place to start just because it can be a little bit discouraging. So that's one thought. Um, another is that the, in, in the past, that sort of hand woodworking um, cabinetry was, was an appealing trade because people needed dining room tables and they would pay you to make it. But now it, you can buy a dining room set from Ikea for a fraction of what it would cost someone to make it by hand. Um, we've developed tools, primarily CNC, computer numerically controlled tools that you program once and then they just zip around and do it. And they can do a better job than a human can at a lot of tasks, which makes, makes the hand woodworker sort of obsolete in some ways. Um, so what that's resulted in is a lot of people sort of switching over to more organic forms of woodworking that that tend to reflect the, the quality of the wood. So in the past, when you were trying to build a cabinet, you would look for the cleanest, straightest grain possible in a piece of wood that had no quirks or knots or anything like that. That was a defect. And that's still how our grading system for wood works. Um, but nowadays, if you go and look at a woodworking show, many of the things will take a burl, which is like a cancerous knot on the side of a tree. And that will be the highlight of the piece. And so a lot of traditional woodworkers would kind of scoff at that and think like, that's not, that's not woodworking, um, but it's gorgeous and it highlights the natural beauty of the wood. River tables are really big recently. So things, uh, a river table is where you have a piece of wood and in one way or another you put resin into it normally in the middle. I'll try to show you a picture here quick and can see how this works. So, your screen, cool, chrome, yep, share. Okay. All right. I'm hoping people can see my screen now. And I'm going to go over and show you what a river table looks like. You've probably seen them before. Here at Make Haven, the facilitator, Jen, is an expert at making these river tables. Um, oftentimes, what you do is you'll take a board with a live edge. And live edge means that the edges were uh, the size of the tree. And then what you do is you cut it down the middle and live edge edge good. You cut it down the middle and invert it. So what were these outside edges, the edges of the tree 
become the inside of your table. So that that's straight because those are the straight lines that you cut and the inside has all this amazing character that you fill with resin that you can color. So in terms of like the skill that it takes to make it, it's, it doesn't take 10 years of work um, and study, but it's incredible looking. So that's kind of, that's where we're at. And some people are really sad about that and some people aren't really sad about that. It sort of lowered the barrier of entry to make really widely appreciated uh, furniture and things. So yes, that's kind of cool. Then let's see. So what is next? Cool. So in terms of safety, like slightly less relevant because you're not actually here, but we'll cover it all the same. So in the wood shop, we always wear eye protection uh, as well as the metal shop. The, a lot of the tools in here have carbide tips on them. So a saw blade, for example, has is a steel circle and the tips of the teeth are carbide, which is a very hard kind of steel. It's very brittle. And if it were to hit something particularly hard, like a nail, it could shatter off and shoot like a bullet. And so even if you're standing on the other side of the room, not participating in, in any of those the power tool activities, you could still be hurt from that. And so that's why that's one of the reasons why eye protection is required. Flying things that you have no control over may be taking place. Uh, maybe at one point no one's using a tool, but then it's really easy to turn a chops on really quickly. And before you have time to get your glasses on, there's there's stuff flying around. So eye, eye protection is required. Um, in terms of ears and lungs, those are things that are up to people's discretion. Um, we have a pretty good dust collection system as well as dust mitigation for getting it out of the air once it's in the air. The uh, And in terms of ears, there are some tools that are pretty loud. So we have ear protectors. Um, but uh, that's sort of that's that's at your own that's at your own discretion. Um, yeah. So I would say in terms of like general safety, the two things that I, I tend to think of as structurally important for having a safe working environment are learning how to use a tool confidently and competently, um, having proper respect for it, but also being confident enough so that you're using it safely. If you're holding something really timidly. Um, it's it, it'll just get ripped right out of your hands and, and that's more dangerous than really confidently holding on to it similarly um well being overly confident not having enough respect for the tool could could also get you very injured um so that's that's one aspect i think not fighting the tool is really important so that applies to both hand woodworking and using power tools um though obviously you put more muscle into it when you are using a hand hand tool you still shouldn't be fighting it. If you're finding that it's just not moving and you're you're getting angry because it's not moving, something's wrong there. And with power tools, it's even more so. If you find that you're really having to work at something, it's going to turn around and bite you. It's way more powerful than you are. And if that motor binds up or something, something's, something's going to go. So you don't want to be fighting the tool at any point. And, and another point is cleanliness is really important. If you leave stuff strewn all over the floor, that's a great way to trip and, you know, all kinds of bad things. Walking backwards is something that doesn't normally occur to people, but that's a pretty big rule um, in, in shop etiquette in general is, is walking backwards is a bad idea. But you don't normally like that doesn't occur, occur to most people, but that's pretty important. Um, okay, so we've covered like the basics and now we'll get into wood. Um, and let's see, I'm just gonna check the chat to see everyone's still here. And I'm not just talking to myself. <laughs> cool. So. Um, great. So yeah, so wood, so in general, and I'm sure like I'm, I'm not a herbivorist or arborist or whatever. So I'm, I'm sure this is not hundred percent right, but us, and so there are exceptions, but I think in general, at least in North America, there are two kinds of trees, coniferous and deciduous with conifers being things like spruce and pine, they're evergreens, uh, they grow relatively quickly and they have relatively soft wood. So this, for example, is a piece of pine. It looks like it's from Home Depot because it has this sort of polished look to it. And it's a soft wood. Uh, and it's, it, this is like a, a responsibly grown wood. Um, and what that means is that normally it'll have an FSA certification, which is like Forestry Service of America or something. And that means they're planting trees as quickly as they're cutting them down. And you can only really do that with soft woods because the return on investment for a hardwood would, is prohibitively long. So they, they might they might be able to do that somewhere, but in general, it's for softwoods. And like, so this 
is the result of many processes. So let's let's get to that first. So we have trees and they're they're growing either evergreens or deciduous, which are things like um, maple and cherry and walnut, things that are harder that lose their leaves in the winter and they take longer to grow. Um, just as an example of this, I'm gonna try to show you the end of this board and it, you can see maybe that that is- are. Yeah. Not to interrupt, but uh, I think you're still, you're still in the presentation mode. So we're looking at you through another window. If you went out of that, I think it would be probably better. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Uh, okay, so this is one ring. So if you imagine if you've seen a tree cut in half, um, you, you've seen the rings in a tree, and this is one, and that's another. And you can see on this side too, here's the side of one ring, and here's close to the other side. So what that means is in the course of one year, the tree grew that much, which is an enormous amount. So they have these trees just really cranking out. Um, and that's that's really cool because that means we can use wood responsibly and something I'm just going to throw out, even though I don't know where this fits in logically, but some people will come to Make Haven and not want to use wood because it's you're cutting down trees and that seems environmentally irresponsible. Um, but in actuality, using wood as your building material is very responsible if the wood is responsibly harvested. Uh, the wood like this is made out of carbon that was pulled out of the air. And so this is a method of carbon sequestration that is it's pulling carbon out of the air and then you're locking it into a thing. Um, so if you, it, you know, if you use, if you use this and you make a thing out of it and you keep that thing for a hundred years, that carbon is locked in place for a hundred years, which is pretty cool versus something like plastic, which is a petroleum product that was pulled out of the earth. And there's a lot of refining and processing that goes into making it. Um, so that is a, less environmentally responsible option. Now, obviously the caveat is if you're using some African exotic hardwood and that is definitely not being replanted, um, that's probably not a great option. Um, beautiful though those woods may be. Uh, okay, so we'll just look briefly at the, I'm gonna reshare my screen so I can show you some of the tabs that I pulled up. I'm gonna figure out how to move you. Present now. Screen, yeah. There. Um, okay, so some of the things I pulled up here. So this is this is a sawmill. So this is a pretty small one, um, but here you can see that this is a big bandsaw, similar to the ones we have at Make Haven, just bigger and horizontal. And they have rollers that are moving this tree through, and it's just cutting up into slabs. So this is milling, like at a sawmill, and this is one of the first steps that the wood goes through. Um, there are other ways of doing it. So here they're cutting it at a slightly different orientation. This is an older kind where it's literally just a, not even a bandsaw, but a big old circular saw, which is pretty crazy. And then the other image I wanted to show you is this one. So if you imagine this long tree, these are different ways of cutting it up. And it's, it's important. So you can imagine this live saw and the one on the right is the most efficient. It's the easiest. You just cut, chop, chop, top to bottom. You get almost all the wood gets used except for the kerf or that blade, turn that wood into sawdust. Um, but if you look down here at the picture of this live sawn piece of wood, you can see there's a lot going on in it. It's not very consistent. And so historically we didn't like this very much. Um, just because if you had this on a panel, someone looks at that and says like, in their minds, it wasn't a great piece of wood. Now in their defense, one of the reasons it isn't a great piece of wood necessarily, especially if you get it through the middle of the tree, is there can be a lot of warping. Um, so there are different ways that a piece of wood can warp. So let's say we had this piece of wood. If it were to twist like this, I mean, I can't twist it. You see it's too thick, but if, if you can imagine it being twisted, uh, that would be one way it could warp over time. Another is for it to uh, cup. So that would be if it was like this, so over its length, if it was, um, if it was cupped and then the other is for there to be a over the whole length for there to be a warp um, so those are different ways that so i'm just going to go back to this picture to sorry this picture of what, what could happen to this piece of wood versus something rifts on and if we look here every single piece of wood that they cut out of this is as perpendicular as can be to the middle of the tree and so that means is you have this very consistent grain coming out of it. 
And so in general, that historically has been preferred. And this will be a little more expensive because it's harder to cut. Um, but that's people people like that. Um, quarter sawn and rift sawn are, are pretty similar. And then plain sawn is another way of getting a lot of different sizes of lumber out of the piece of wood, but is, um, yeah, but it, it produces all different kinds of, of shapes and whatnot, and, and they aren't necessarily very stable. So when you're going to a lumber yard at some point, you'll be able to see those, those different ways that they've cut the wood, and you can say, hey, I want this, or I want this. Uh, we'll get to buying wood later, though. So this is the first step, is milling it into these planks. Uh, and then you have to let wood dry. So when you cut it, wood is green, and the green wood, uh, it's not great to work with because a lot of it will crack as the moisture evaporates from it. It can warp, like I described earlier, and uh, and then you would make the thing, and then a week later it would be broken and cracked and warped. So it's really not very fun to work with green wood, with, with some exceptions. So what you do is you sticker the wood. So you take those long planks, and then you take sticks and put it in between just so air can flow and you let it dry. So some people do that in their backyard over a year or two. Um, the, so that they'll have all that wood stacked up from a tree and all stickered and just let the air flow through it, covered from rain, but just exposed to the environment other than that so that the wood can dry out. The, the wood is pretty much, you can imagine it like a whole bunch of stacked up straws that run along the length of the tree. So let's look at this end again, if we can. Um, so you can sort of see the curve going like this. So you can imagine that the middle of the tree was over here somewhere. And then the rings radiated out and out and out like that. And uh, so that, um, yeah, so that the straws then run along those rings and they're for conducting water throughout the tree, up and down and, and whatnot. So um, that is going to be how the water escapes. So you need to have it exposed so that some water can escape through the surface. But by and large, it's coming out of the ends. So a lot of the time when you buy wood, you will actually see paint on the ends, green, blue paint. And the purpose of that is to help seal it a little bit, because if the water comes out too quickly, it'll just crack. It's called checking at the ends, just as the water comes out really quickly and those fibers shrink. But the rest of the board still is full of water. And so it stays the same size, and so it'll it'll crack. So there's a bunch of things that people do to try to help it to dry well. In a more commercial setting versus in someone's backyard, what they'll do is put it in a big kiln. And so there are a lot of different kinds of kilns, but effectively it's, it's a really big oven that you put whole slabs of trees into, and it pulls out the moisture. It makes it, it doesn't get crazy hot, but it's hot enough to help pump the moisture out so that they can sell it more quickly. Um, yeah, so then after you, then, then the wood gets sent to the lumber yard where you can buy it. And with our late Townsend Reader rugby store, uh, you could go there and see the wood and you could see there was rough. And I grabbed a bunch of different kinds of wood and I did not think to grab rough wood, but it'd be kind of hard to tell anyway. But for anyone who has seen it, rough wood is literally rough. It feels not quite like sandpaper, but it's rough. Uh, there are a lot of fibers they use a really uh, coarse saw that chugged through the wood, but it left a lot of fibrous material sticking out. And then you need to dress the wood. So dressing is the process of taking that rough piece of lumber and turning it into a piece of wood that you can work with. Uh, and traditionally, or normally what, what you can expect is to lose about a half inch of wood during the dressing process. So normally you wanna buy a piece of wood about a half inch thicker than what you want your final piece of wood to be. Uh, with the reason being, if you if you don't, then you'll end up with a thinner piece of wood than you want. Because if it has a little cup to it, it has a warp, a little bend, then trying to as you take that out during the dressing process, you're going to lose a bunch of wood. <clears throat> so that's just something you need to bear in mind. Um, then, and just as long as we're on on that topic, the wood, the thickness of the wood at a lumber yard is normally measured in quarters. I, I don't know why. Um, but four quarters is how you say one inch. It's, it's still in inches, it's just quarters of inches. Five quarters, an inch and a quarter, six quarters, an inch and a half. It's just like a, yeah, I don't know. I'm sure there's some historical reason behind it. And then when you wanna say how much wood you want, 
you don't just say, I want five feet of it because that would be too easy. You say how many board feet you want and board feet is actually a unit of volume. So a board foot is one foot wide by another foot long uh, and one inch thick. So that is a unit board foot. Um, but let's say your board is two inches thick, then it would only be six inches wide and 12 inches longer. You, you can do the math uh, if you want, but that's, that's how they calculate. There's special yardsticks that measure the board footage of your piece of wood. And that's how you determine how much it'll cost. Let's say like $3 a board foot for this maple. Uh, and that's how you determine it. So now that Downs and Reader is no longer with us, we there are other options in the area. There's the Branford Lumber Rack. Uh, there is, uh, what's it called? America something. We have a whole list on the website of all the local suppliers. And what something we're actually hoping to do once this whole fiasco is over is have um, maybe like a monthly supply come in of wood that members can buy just because going out and getting having to get a truck or something to get the wood is a big old pain and it's a cool experience to see a lumber yard but it's a pretty big inhibitor to people starting projects so something we're hoping to do is to be able to resell some wood here for people to work with um, obviously we wouldn't stock a whole lot but it would just be enough to to lower that barrier to entry a little bit so okay so now we're back to the wood that we ended up with here and the dressing process of either softwood or hardwood is pretty similar. The only, the differences between softwood and hardwood for our purposes is just the hard was harder. Um, and that means it's harder to work with, but it's also more durable. So if you're making something that you want to last for a while, you probably make it out of hardwood. If you're just doing a prototype or you're doing something that most people aren't going to see, um, it doesn't, you know, it's behind a wall or something then you make it out of softwood because it's cheaper. So that's that's kind of the deal. I would definitely say if you're practicing with hand tools, you definitely want to start with softwood. You'll just feel much better about yourself if you start with softwood um, and then you move on to hardwood when you're ready and you really know how to sharpen a chisel and you know how to move your torso when you're using a plane because if you start on oak, you're just going to give up that hobby really quickly. Don't want that. So here um, we have a piece of pine, which is kind of cool. And now we're gonna talk about the, well, let me just check this to make sure I'm not going completely over the place. Um, all right, so, yeah, so we'll talk about the grain. So here we spoke about how the, the, well, I guess we didn't. So the grain are literally the fibers running up and down the tree and they reflect differently in a piece of, of wood. So here the grain is running this way, which is in the same direction as the tree was, obviously. There are, and, and the long dimension of the piece of wood conveniently. Um, and and it's, it, that's something that is super different than plastic, than metal, than a lot of other materials. And it's really important to get your head around because it will completely inform how you use the piece of wood. Uh, the properties are, are, the engineering term is anisymmetric. It means it's, they are not uniformly or, or depending on how you orient the piece of material. Um, so for example, this piece of wood is pretty strong in this direction. Like if you try to karate chop this, you need to be a black belt or something. Uh, versus going in this direction in between the fibers, if you imagine this is a bunch of straws, it's much easier to sort of pull those fibers of straws across versus cutting through all of those fibers of straws with your hand. Uh, so the wood is much weaker in that direction. So I grabbed this piece of wood from the scrap in the back just because it's a good example. This is oak, it's a hardwood. Um, but it's a good example of how here the long dimension is actually across the grain versus with the grain. So uh, this is came from the tree. So we can see the middle of the tree was somewhere over here. And this, the long dimension is actually the weak dimension here because you, you could, I mean, if this were software, I could probably just break it with my hands. Um, so as you're learning about how to work with the wood, that's important. Another important consideration is that if we think of these as straws, these are very absorbent. So if you put glue on this, it'll get absorbed really quickly and make a really poor joint. So if I were to glue these two together, just like this, uh, it's really, this whole mirroring thing is confusing. Um, it would be a pretty, pretty poor joint because all the glue would get right ab absorbed right into here. And then you could just sort of break it apart versus let's, so one way to get around that is to put some glue on this first and let it dry. Um, just to seal up those pores. And then the second time around, it'd be stronger. 
Um, another, like the, the more respectable trick, I guess, is to create more surface area on face grain. So just for more terminology, this is face grain, this is side or edge grain, and this is end grain. And end grain tends to be your enemy because it's really hard to cut this way. It's much easier to cut with the grain than against the grain. And it also absorbs glue. So the, the worst joint possible is end grain to end grain because both sides are trying to absorb the glue. So it's really easy just to break that apart. So that we want to avoid. And there are lots of ways of trying to avoid that that we'll, we'll get to later. Um, in terms of what other weird qualities this wood has by virtue of it being wood and not something that is more isometric is um, that with humidity and temperature, it changes properties and it changes properties differently in each in each dimension, which makes it pretty difficult to work with. So that, that's a whole book in and of itself. Um, dressing. Okay, so when it comes to dressing, the goal is to make it S4S. So S4S stands for square on four sides. So that means with this piece of wood, this top is parallel to the bottom. This side is parallel to this side, and the uh, and those and those two surfaces, those four surfaces are perpendicular, or those two are perpendicular to the other two. Uh, so that is that defines an S4S piece of wood, and that's what you want to work with. If you're trying to put two things together and one's a little bit crooked. That's really annoying. So normally when you get your wood, the first thing you do is you dress it to make it S4S. Um, that's just sort of a nice standard to work with. Um, something I'm just going to throw out there is if you get wood from Home Depot, which I highly discourage whenever possible because it's a very poor quality and very, very expensive. Um, it a lot of times will sell dimensional. So that, well, so if you buy something, like a two by four and a two by four, is something, it's a name. It's not actually describing the dimensions because when they cut that piece of wood at the sawmill, it was in fact two inches by four inches. But like I said before, when you dress wood, you often lose about half an inch. So that two becomes one and a half and the four becomes three and a half. So a two by four is not actually two inches by four inches. It's one and a half inches by three and a half inches. So that can be pretty confusing. Uh, and that applies, applies to some other things like plywood as well. So you just need to be really careful and maybe measure things when you're when you're buying from there because it isn't always what it, what you think it is. Um, okay, so something else we'll look at is different types of, of wood products. So we've looked at soft woods and hard woods, which are like, they're very real wood. But there's a lot of other things that people have figured out how to make. So plywood is is really cool. So like I was saying before, this wood is really strong with the grain, um, but it's not very strong when you try to like go this way. Um, so for example, this piece of wood is getting a little bit flatter. So the grain goes this way and I could actually probably break this, you know, like this is a great karate chopping piece of wood because you karate chop it this way and break it, um, which is cool. But you can see like, first of all, they don't make trees four feet wide anymore that are supposed to be cut down. Uh, and two, even if they did, it would still be weak in this direction. So what they did is they invented plywood and plywood is made by taking a whole freaking tree and using a big razor blade and shaving it. So they spin the tree against a razor blade until they have these long flat sheets of, of wood that are pretty thin and then they glue them together. So here's a piece of plywood and you can see the plies. So in here, this is, this is two ply and a veneer. So I don't know what you'll be able to see, maybe not much, but you can easily see, I think, the, the one, two plies. And with these two plies, the wood has alternating grain. So on one surface, on one layer or one ply of the wood, the grain is going this way, and another ply, they're going this way. And what that accomplishes is it helps make it about an equal strength in both directions. So they took those big sheets and they stacked them and glued them. And now you can have a big old sheet of wood to stick on the side of your house or make something out of that's pretty dimensionally stable, which is pretty cool. In this case, they also put a veneer on the surface and a veneer is just an especially thin layer of wood. I think it's, it's so thin, it may be hard to see. Um, but yeah, so you might be able to see it there, but it's a really thin layer and they glued that on top. And this is made out of a nicer wood. And so they took this nicer tree that's more expensive and cut into really thin layers and put it on top. So it looks from this side, like a nice piece of wood, 
And on the back side, you're like, oh, no, that's not nice. That's got a big old hole right in the middle. But from this side, you put this on the outside and people are like, oh, they made it out of a nice piece of wood. And you're like, no, I didn't. So that's kind of cool. Then I thought I grabbed a bunch of others, but maybe I did not. But there are things like plywood. Um, gosh, where do I? Huh. It's gotten distracted at some point. Shocking. But yeah, so plywood, um, sorry. MDF is something that's made out of like a fine dust and glued together. It stands for medium density fiberboard. And that's just like a glued together chunk. Uh, it's almost like cardboard. It, it kind of behaves a bit like cardboard. Um, so that is good for some things. If you want to make a box and it's totally indoors, then it could be good. Uh, it's very heavy. And it's also 100% not water resistant at all. Like if a drop of water touches it, it just turns into mush. Um, so bear that in mind. Um, then there's OSB, which is oriented strand board. And that's where they take like wood chips and just glue them together and smush it. And that's one of the cheapest kinds of sheeting you can buy. So if you're for like the side of a house, something that no one's ever going to see. So when I say the side of a house, I mean the structural thing that's holding it from the house from tilting over, not the part that you're actually seeing. So it goes underneath whatever siding you put on your house. Um, and so you'd make it out of OSB because it's pretty cheap and no one's going to see it and it's strong enough. Um, there's also pressure treated wood. I just, I'm going to find this pile of wood I put somewhere. And pressure treated wood is normally a greenish in hue and it's been put in a big tank with really high pressure and they inject chemicals into it that helps it from rotting and stops bugs from eating it. Um, so it makes it just a nice thing to have if you're working outdoors. Um, so if you're doing a post that's going to stick into the ground, something that's being exposed to a lot of weather, it's a good thing to use. Uh, you don't want to use it in anything that is going to like really be touching your skin a whole lot or is going to be certainly having food on it. Um, it's, um, yeah, I think it's less carcinogenic than it used to be, but it's developed a pretty bad name. So if you did do that, people would still think it was a bad idea, even if it isn't a bad idea anymore. I don't actually really know where we're at on that, but in general, you just don't really want to come into a lot of contact with pressure treated wood. Something else to bear in mind is that after it comes out of that tank, it's actually pretty wet and, and quite heavy. So you want to let that wood dry for a bit before you use it because it'll change shape and warp and whatnot as the moisture is coming out. So you want to have that final piece of wood that you're working with. And another consideration is uh, working on wood that's wet can be much harder. So it's just in your benefit to let it dry a little bit. If you put it on the saw stop, it could also actually activate the saw stop um, stopping mechanism. So just, just bear that in mind too. So cool, we went over quarters and board, board feet, um, blah, 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 the directions you would go in. So, um, okay, so then just for more terminology, let's say we had this piece of wood and you wanted to cut it. So you wanted to give this, I mean, language is pretty good for conveying things to other people. So that's especially what this is for, but what you, let's say I ask someone to rip this piece of wood in half, um, what that would mean is to cut along the long dimension uh, across the wide dimension. So that would be cutting this way. That would be ripping a piece of wood. Uh, cross cutting is going across the grain. So I'd be cutting it this way. And then resawing would be cutting this way through the piece of wood like that. So let's say you bought a piece of wood and we wanted two skinnier pieces, we would resaw it. Or let's say you're making a veneer. The way you would make a veneer is by resawing this very thin little layers. Um, or you wanted little long posts, then you could rip this. So that, this just sort of helps to have that terminology in your head. So when you're talking to people, you can when you say like cut it in half, you're not saying like hot dog hamburger way, you're, you have the words to help people understand what you want. So that's kind of useful. Um, all right, so now we'll get into the tools that you can use to cut things. Um, and then we'll get it, we'll, after we've talked about cutting things apart, we'll talk about putting things together. So in terms of cutting things, for saw blades, um, they normally have a sharp edge of some kind. Uh, so say on like a table saw blade, they'll have teeth going around. You know, I'll just go, I'll be back in 10 seconds, I'm gonna grab some blades.
we can all just talk amongst ourselves for a moment, <laughs> but not too long. Okie dokie. Um, so I got some blades, and the point I wanted to make is that I think regardless, and don't hold me to this, but I think regardless of the tool you use, this rule holds, where the bigger the teeth you have, uh, the more wood you're going to take out more quickly, but the more rough of a cut you're going to make. Uh, also, which which kind of makes it more suitable to softer materials. Versus a harder material, you want to use a, a smaller tooth, so each tooth is biting away at less wood, and that lets it cut through harder materials. If you're trying to take a big bite out of a really hard wood, you're going to have a really hard time doing that. So this is a kind of cool saw. This is a Japanese saw. Um, and uh, it's cool for a few reasons. So one, it's a flush cut saw, which means that I can, let's say I was trying to cut something on the surface of this. I can flex it like that. So that's pretty cool. You can't do that with an American saw. Um, another, and this is like a pretty definitive, this is what makes it a Japanese saw, is that it cuts when you're pulling. So if you look here at these teeth, especially the big ones are easy to see, it doesn't do anything if I'm pushing the saw. So pushing does nothing. It's pulling where those teeth are biting in. So this, this blade is cool just because it has different size teeth on each side, but it's the same idea here. When I'm pushing, it does nothing. When I'm pulling is when it's cutting. Versus an American saw, And on an American saw, whoop, it's pretty sharp. This is going to cut when you're pushing. So I don't know if you, there we go. So yeah, it's going to cut when you're pushing, but pulling doesn't do anything. Um, and I'm sure there are tons of theories about why that's, why, which is better, whatever. Um, I think in general, I don't really have a preference. They're both, they're both good for their own purposes. Um, but that holds when we're looking at a table saw blade. So in this this blade, I'll let you, well, so you can maybe read right off of it, if you can read in the mirror. But it's uh, this is a ripping blade. And so when you're ripping, is normally you're going through a really long board, because remember, a, a ripping is normally along the long dimension of that piece of wood that's along the length of the tree. And you want to be able to take out a lot of material at times. These are called the gullets of a blade. And this is what fills with sawdust as it's cutting. So if you can imagine us cutting through this piece of wood, this tooth here is going to start cutting and it needs to fill with sawdust and not fill up by the time it dumps it down the bottom. If it does, it won't be cutting. If that whole thing is full of sawdust, that tooth won't be able to bite anything. Um, but it'll leave a pretty rough finish because all those teeth are hogging out so much material at a time. This is a finish blade, so it's lots of really small teeth. And this is good for leaving a really, it, it, some of them say, yeah, it says ultimate flawless finish, which is maybe a little bit excessive, but it hopefully leaves a pretty smooth finish. Um, but if you try to rip a long board with this, you're going to be at it for a while because each of those teeth is going to fill up in a hot second. So then you'll just be kind of slowly moving it through without a lot of progress. And then this is a combination blade. So this is just in the middle, uh, has a medium number of teeth. Um, also, there's, there's, a whole world of blade design. So if you look at these teeth, you might be able to see that probably not, but oh, maybe. So these teeth are alternating in the direction that they're tilting. So each one is cutting on the left, cutting on the right, and they actually leave a, leave a little V groove. They don't leave a flat bottom. Some blades have flat teeth, so they leave a flat bottom when they're cutting. Um, some cut to one side. If you're always gonna commit to cutting one side of the line, so leave a smoother edge on that side. Um, there's also, so the kerf is a word I think I mentioned before. The kerf is the, how, how much wood, how wide a slice of wood this blade is going to cut out of it. And that kerf needs to be a little bit wider than the blades. That blade can fit through it. You can also probably see here that I've got this light right behind, that these are the carbide teeth that are brazed on to the body. And brazing is, is similar to welding. So those are brazed right on there. If you hit a piece of metal, it'll probably chip right off. Once a blade like this loses like, three teeth, it's probably time to toss it. But if a blade gets dull before it's lost teeth, then we can either sharpen ourselves or probably send them as a bundle to someone who sharpens saw blades all day and night. And that will be, that actually might still be in business. You can do that alone. Um, maybe we should start that company. Um, sorry. So 
Uh, yeah, so that's that saw blades. And then this is just a bandsaw blade. So a bandsaw, um, one of the main uses for bandsawing is resawing. And you can see that the blade is very thin. And so the idea behind that is it's removing very little wood, which means it takes less force. When you're cutting through a piece of wood like this, or many times thicker, you want to you need a really, really powerful motor to remove this thickness of wood from that much height. So you remember seeing that massive saw blade in the picture earlier. So um, when you use a band saw blade, it's just removing much less wood at a time, which is nice economically, but it's also nice because um, it requires less power. Um, if we look at the teeth here, this, is a, this isn't like our biggest blade, but it's, it's pretty big. It's a half inch wide. And one way that you measure teeth on a blade is by teeth per inch. So in one inch here, this has two or three TPI, teeth per inch. Um, so that's, that's kind of cool. They have a little set to them. So set is when the teeth alternate back and forth side to side so that they clear a path out for the blade behind it. Um, yeah, oh wow. Never mind, thought I saw something cool. <laughs> Um, all right, those are some blades. Uh, yeah, cool. So back as we were, then let's see. So yeah, hopefully you might have a handsaw at home, in which case, by all means, grab some uh, um, some piece of scrap wood or firewood or something and try cutting. And it's it's definitely a skill to learn how to get the blade to bite without it just all those teeth engaging and you're not being able to push through it all. So you, in general, if this is a piece of wood we were trying to cut, you'd want to start by going like this and just get a little nick started and then start getting into it. Because if you try to start with that full engagement across the surface, that's a whole lot of resistance you're working against. So you want to start breaking through those fibers at the corner and then go through like that. Um, so for thought. Um, cool. All right. So, um, yeah. And, uh, um, well, okay. So now we'll get to, so I was cutting wood. Uh, did anyone post any questions? Oh, wow. There's 28 messages. Are, are there any questions about um, cutting things? I mean, there are obviously lots and lots of different tools for cutting. If you want to do circular stuff, you could use a jigsaw, you could use a CNC, you could use a hole saw. Let's, yeah, grab that guy. So this is a hole saw. So it has those same teeth, but oriented in a hole pattern. So you put it in a drill, like this guy, and it spins and cuts a hole in a circle. That's pretty cool. But it won't do, so we'll just, we'll just go into drill bits, because why not? Um, <laughs> uh, good question. Um, so, okay, so Mary just asked a question. Uh, I had a Japanese saw and broke all the teeth off. Any tips for avoiding that? Just be more patient. Um, so I think the reality is they make a lot of really crummy Japanese saws that um, just like if you buy it from Home Depot, that they're just not very good and it is very easy to knock the teeth off. Um, so that's part of it. Like part of it's not you, part of it is the saw. Um, another is, were you trying to cut metal? I'm kind of, I'm surprised that the teeth would come off cutting wood, but, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, Kate asked, does the environmental friendliness also apply to hardwood, which takes longer to grow? So yeah, so hardwood takes much longer to grow. So an oak tree will take decades versus a pine tree, which will take much less than that. Um, and um, they do make responsibly grown wood. And especially, so if you buy wood from a place like City Bench, uh, which we're hope, I hope we're able to do soon, they use trees and mill them and dry them that have been cut down in New Haven for forestry reasons. So if you have a well-maintained forest, they do cut trees down regularly. Cutting trees down is a responsible environmental practice if done responsibly. So uh, around the city of New Haven, trees need to be cut down because they're going to fall on power lines. They, you know, for whatever reason, they need to be cut down. And in forests, trees need to be cut down. Uh, identifying the wood that has been responsibly grown can be tricky. There are certifications like the FSA, um, but sometimes, um, 
Yeah. When you buy from Citibench, then you you know for sure. Uh, some other, if you buy it through a distributor, it can probably be harder to harder to tell. Um, Julia, waxing a blade, one hundred percent helps. Or does that just create a resist for finishes? You know. Yeah. No. I would say so. We have paste wax, which comes in a yellow container that I don't see immediately, but it's probably up on that shelf. Um, and it's you just buy it as like yeah, it's called paste wax. Put it on a paper towel and buff it into any surface that wood is sliding against. So table saw, planer, jointer, hand plane. So like I was planing a bench top the other day and was chugging along, and then I realized that it was just feeling a little bit sluggish. Like I was I wasn't pushing so much against the wood that I was cutting on the blade, but was just like it was dragging slowly on the wood. Um, and so wax it up and it just it just glides so it makes a huge difference uh we have wax to put on the bandsaw blades um yeah the planer i said um if you're drilling a hole in wood and it's squealing just because the side of the wood is, is squealing uh, the bit is squealing against the wood you can put wax on the side of the bit that helps a lot um there there are probably many applications in terms of Resisting finishes, I don't. My sense is that you don't get a lot of transfer of the wax to the to the wood. Like that's not a terribly significant amount. Um, I've never experienced that, but maybe maybe someone has a more, um, yeah, has more knowledge on that. Um, mm -mm. It was good. Good to know. Maybe. Oh, uh, tell us about the oak bench and the tree it came from. Uh, I well, I have no idea which tree the bench came from but the wood was from city bench and they just collect trees that have been or being cut down around the city from uh the various organizations so i, I don't know that they didn't give me the specific tree it was just in a pile of logs um candles could totally work the uh the paste wax is like it's a wax that's in like a pretty volatile thing like it's actually not it's you don't want to like finish a bowl with it or something because it's it's kind of it's like not in a great chemical um and i'm not totally sure at purpose that maybe it like helps keep it thinner so it's more easily spreadable um but and so which is just to say like that beeswax might have or any kind of candle wax may not have those properties that are presumably beneficial but using wax for finishing wood is definitely like beeswax is what you use for finishing a bowl um you could use so or candle wax like those are things that are great for finish i'm not Sure, if they have something different in it that makes paste wax a better lubricant than a finish. Um, okay, so drill bit types, we hit on the weirdest kind, or one of the weirder kinds, which is a whole saw. They make these in all big sizes. This is engaging a lot of wood at once. Uh, and so we can just touch on briefly the two kinds of hand drills we have here at Makehaven. So this is the drill type that probably most people are familiar with. And what is, uh, it's, it's, it actually has three modes, but normally we don't really use all of them. So right now it's on fastener mode and fastener mode engages this clutch up at the top. So what this clutch does is a clutch is something that it, it um, when there's enough torque, it engages and when there's not enough torque, it doesn't engage. So here on one, if you're drilling along and that our screw finally goes in deep enough and then I'm holding on to it. Oops. You can just hear it sort of clicking, and that's how it knows not to keep drilling deeper into the wood or screwing deeper into the wood. So that's kind of a cool feature. Um, it doesn't get used all that frequently, but it, there are circumstances where it's great. Then this is drill mode, and in drill mode, there's no this torque clutch doesn't do anything. It's just going to give it all it's got. So it's going to keep trying to turn that thing until it it can't. And if you have a hole saw in here and it bites into that wood, there have been a bunch of times where I'm surprised my wrist wasn't broken. Because it, I mean, it'll. This thing's got a lot of torque, and if you aren't really holding it on, having this up against your chest, I mean, this thing can really torque right on you. So a hole saw, if possible, you want to use in the drill press because the drill press is going to hold it totally perpendicular. It can handle that torque versus the hand drill, which is relying on you to hold on to it. We do have handle extensions up on the wall that you can attach to the top. They clamp right on on these little dovetails. That helps you get a better grip. But bear that in mind. There are two speeds on here. So this is number two, this is number one. The um, only reason I'm going over this is like hand drills are just pretty fundamental to woodworking. So I feel like it's valuable to touch on. 
in terms of loading things into the drill, so this is a keyless chuck. Some older drills have keyed chucks, which use a, a chuck key to turn. So you can open it by hand, or you can put it in reverse. You can see that guy. Hold on to it, spin it and it opens, put it in forward, spin it and it closes. So this is a little trick here, but if you can put the bit in and hold it with your hand, then with two hands you hold this, the, the chuck, and the bit, and then in forward, and then that last little bit of torque you apply with your hands. That's just a nice way of getting it on and then similarly getting it off instead of going like this all day. Um, so this is used normally for drilling holes. This has a bunch of like Wi-Fi enabled stuff. We don't really use that here. Um, it's like for different modes for different people and different tasks. And then on the battery, which comes off when you pinch these guys, uh, this just tells you how much life it has. So this is full of juice. And then the other commonly used hand drill is an impact driver. So this is a pretty cool tool. Um, it's, you can tell the profile is a little different. Down here, you can control the speed. So one is pretty slow, two, three uh, is very fast. And then this last one is a special thing for putting in self-tapping screws. So, um, or self-drilling, I think they're called. So self-drilling screws are for sheet metal, and it goes really, really fast in the beginning while it's drilling that hole, because it has a special little drill bit in the tip, and then it slows down as soon as it feels it punched through. So we don't use that terribly frequently. An impact driver is used pretty much exclusively for putting in screws. So you're trying to put in screws, and we'll cover those in a minute, use the impact driver. Um, the, the point of the impact driver is with each rotation, it's hammering on the back of it. So oftentimes, if you're trying to get a screw in, and a screw could look like this guy. If you are just trying to twist, it can take a lot of work. But if you're twisting and whacking it on the back, that impulse can help get it in a lot more quickly with a lot less force. Um, so this is a just a gangbuster tool. And also, if you're trying to apply torque to something else or like tr quickly put on a socket, that's pretty great. The chuck is very different on here. So this chuck, you pull this collar up, and then the piece comes out. So this little guy comes up. Um, and the idea there is you need a little play here. Play meaning like slop, like it can, it can move around. Because let's say this was in the head of our screw and it didn't, every time it hammered, this thing would, would jump right out. So we, this is just an extension I'm gonna remove because kind of a pain. So we have this guy and um, yeah, it needs to be able to bounce back and forth. So some people think that's a problem, but it's not. It's supposed to be there. Then... Really, are? Uh, yeah. Hey, I was just going to um, pause real quick because it is 3.30, and I think we said an hour. Um, so I just want to check in with people because I don't know if people have, I guess, other rooms of their houses to go to <laughs> or or whatever, but, um, but other things. Um, and uh, just, just make that note. And also that I can see we could do an entire thing on um, fasteners and drills might be cool too. Back to you. Cool. Yeah. And obviously if anyone has to go, I, I won't be offended. I unfortunately probably won't even know. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we, that screws um, and drills. This is what, an, did I really not? Oh, yes, I did. So this is what a normal drill bit looks like. It's called a twist drill bit type for making, I mean, it's a pretty big one, but for making relatively normal sized holes. This has two cutting edges instead of like those 50 teeth that the other guy had. It's called a Forstner bit. Forstner bit is for also making pretty big holes, but with flat bottoms versus a hole saw, which has to go all the way through. Uh, the list goes on. There's, this is an abrasive one for cutting through tile. So that's pretty cool. This is a step drill bit. This is for going, let's, let's say you wanted like, I don't know, one and an eighth inches and you want to buy a massive one and an eighth inch drill bit. This just goes boop, 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 through something like sheet metal, something pretty thin until you get to that size. So that's kind of cool. Um, up, up, um, drill bit types. Okay, so um, in terms of putting things together, we looked at screws for a hot second. So screws, I just like put this through here because I was fiddly. So uh, a screw is, has a pointy tip and threads. So that's sort of what makes something a screw versus something like a bolt. This also has threads, but it not, does not have a pointy tip. 
So if you tried to put this into a piece of wood, you'd be going at it for a while and you would not get very far. This has a pointy tip. So this is self-tapping. What that means is it makes the threads. Tapping is to make threads. So this taps the wood all on its own. So even just using my fingers, I can get this. That's just because it's a particularly soft piece of wood, but I can like get that to screw in there. To put in a screw, you need a screwdriver, either a hand one or an electric one or some other kind. Um, yeah, they make lots of different kinds. Obviously, <clears throat> if you Google like screw types or we have sheets on the Fort Meek even, um, they have all different kinds for different purposes. This is like specifically, this is a deck screw because it has this coating for going through pressure treated wood without rusting. So it's like painted in epoxy so it doesn't rust in the pressure treated wood. It's countersunk, which means that it's gonna smush the wood out of the way. So it sits flush in the wood once it goes through. Um, yeah, so there's a whole world of screws. I'll just grab another random kind. This little guy has like a pan head. And what that means is it's gonna sit flat, like the material, it's gonna sit proud over the material with this head sitting up. It also has like a Phillips and flathead drive top versus this guy is just Phillips, which is the plus. All right, so that is screws. Another way of putting things together is with nails. So this is a nail. Um, and it has a pointy tip, but no threads. And so you put this in with a hammer. You just whack on it and it goes in and you try to not hit your fingers. Um, this is the head uh, of, the, of the nail. So these are really good for doing things quickly. They're also very good in, in what's called shear. So if you're putting two things together that are gonna go like this, then a nail is good because there's a little bit of flex to it. But if it's something in tension like this, and it'll just pull right out. So for example, during Katrina, you could see which houses were put together properly because the ones that had their roofs attached with nails just kind of like, boop, just pulled right off. And the ones attached with screws stayed on just because the wind pulling up wasn't able to pull them off. Um, but a nail is much easier to put in quickly with a nail again, so boom, 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 versus screwing in the screws. So that's something to think about. Um, and then bolts. So this is a nut and a bolt. So these, as we mentioned earlier, have threads, but not pointy tips. And so they thread on there. And then these are for going through a hole that's already been made by something else. This has some washers on it and it can apply a lot of clamping force. This nut in particular has a, is a nylon uh, lock nut because there's a little piece of nylon in there. So when you thread it on, it, it's really hard to vibrate off. So that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so that's some of putting things together. Another way of putting things together is with joints. So the normally we glue joints. There are other, there are a lot of different kinds of glue and then whatever, but normally we glue joints. And like I said before, the goal of a joint is to get as much like face on face area as possible. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Getting a little bit better at this. Okay, so trying. Nope. Nope. Here we go. So these are some different kinds of joints. So this is a half lap. So normally you're trying to put these two pieces of wood together and either you'd have this end grain going up to the side and that's okay, but not great. Or you need to think of some other kind of way, but here the half lap, they remove this material and remove that material. And now you have all of that face gluing up against all of that face. So now you have a really strong joint. You could do a mitered joint, uh, which is okay. You can also do what's called a mitered half lap. So I'll just Google for you, mitered half lap. Um, and that gets both. So you have, it looks like a miter, but it actually is a half lap. So you have all that glue up area, which makes it really strong. I guess that's a better picture. Um, so that's that, like in the world of joinery, that's how you try to put things together to have as much overlap area of face to face. <laughs> um, yeah, and then there's the whole world of Japanese joinery, which I tried to Google some of. Nope. Uh, those are just joints. Well, at some point, Google Japanese. Here we go, here's some. So, I mean, this one is just out of control, but you can see how this is putting end grain to end grain, and you get all of that surface grain gluing up against each other, or not even gluing up. It might be strong enough without glue. Um, here's another way of gluing up end grain. So you have these pieces sliding. I mean, that's just 
I mean, these are enormous amounts of work, but really elegant. And like they're using the strength of the wood that's just inherent to, to make a really strong joint. Um, I mean, some of these are just, I mean, just next level. So yep, so those are different kinds of joints. Um, when you're gluing, in general, you want a clamp. So we would use a clamp like this, and this just squeezes it. So the glue itself is not all that strong. It's really the glue um, sticking to the wood and then to the next piece of wood that's, that's strong. So you want to use that clamp to squeeze things together while they're clamping. So that's, that's a pretty important thing. I just grabbed a bottle of glue here. This is Tight Bond Ultimate 3. And this is just their waterproof one. So it's good for things like cutting boards, things that are outside. Um, in general, when you're putting glue on, you just want enough to have a little squeeze out. So when you put those two pieces of wood together, there's a little bit squeezing out of the top and bottom. It doesn't need to be spraying everywhere. And if there's no glue squeezing out, then you probably didn't put in enough. Um, you can either clean that glue off, like spray it with some water and clean it off then, or you can just scrape it off at a glue scraper when you're done. Um, in terms of sanding, so now we've cut things, we've stuck them together, we glued them. Um, now we want to sand it before we finish it. The sanding, some of sandpaper, um, just as like a fun fact, sandpaper is a relatively new thing. In the past, they just had to be really good woodworkers, uh, make really clean cuts that didn't require sandpaper, which is kind of crazy. But they just had like really sharp knives and they would just cut things so smoothly that they didn't even need sandpaper. Now, obviously, we use sandpaper. Here's just a piece of it. The higher the number, the more grits per inch there are. And that means it's relatively softer. It's all, it goes up to however, like 8,000, something crazy, which just feels butter soft your hand. But that's if you want something really shiny. Normally, for woodworking, you would go up to like 400 max. Um, start at maybe 60, 80, then 120, then 220, 320. I don't know why all the 20s, and then 440. Um, this goes on a power sander and the holes are for the sawdust to get sucked up through. Um, so in terms of finishing after something's been sanded, there are a bunch of tricks. Obviously you can use water just to make sure that that glue has all been sanded away. The finish won't stick to the glue. So it'll look weird if there are blotches of glue sticking through. And you also, um, can use water to spray the wood because what that'll do is it'll get those wood fibers to stand up. So then when you sand it again, you get rid of those wood fibers. Because when you put um, a finish on there, it'll also make those fibers stand up. So it might feel rough. So that can be a good trick for getting a really smooth finish is spraying with some water, getting the hairs to stand up, and then sanding it one last time. Um, there's a whole world of finishes. The, uh, there are some finishes that sink into the material. So those are like stains or oils. They like they actually go into it. And there's some that form films that sit on top of the surface. Like polyurethane forms a layer of plastic on top, but a stain or mineral oil sinks into the wood. So something that forms a protective layer is obviously much more protecting, but it also might not be what we're going for. If you're trying to eat off of it, you don't want to eat plastic, polyurethane. So you might use mineral oil because it'll sink in. It'll help keep the wood from getting um, stained by blueberries or whatever. Um, it'll help water from seeping in and getting nasty. Um, <clears throat> but it won't, mineral oil isn't bad for you. You can use it as medicine actually. So, um, yeah, so obviously feel free to ask or Google or, um, ask on Slack about whatever kinds of finishes you might want to use. The, um, my like go to's for, well, okay. So, so there's also been a, a big transition in, in, in wood finishes in the past darker wood, people thought darker woods were better. So they would just stain everything to look dark so that it looked fancy. Um, now people, again, as I said earlier, like to appreciate wood more for its natural beauty. And so we tend not to stain it as much. We tend to just put a protective finish on it that enhances the, the beauty it already has. Um, so like, here's a piece of walnut. Um, so this is like a really fancy, nice wood that people want their wood to look like. Um, so you would just put like a, you know, like a something clear on top of it effectively so that it isn't changing the color. This is a wood called Purple Heart. Um, purple Heart. Uh, okay, so something else I didn't mention is that when you have a tree, there are two rings. In the middle is the, is the heart wood, and then around that is the sap wood. And um, 
the heartwood is often a different color than the sapwood. In this case, in purple heart, the heartwood is purple. And I don't know if that's showing up with the camera, but this is a purple piece of wood, which is pretty crazy. I don't, I try not to buy it because I just assume it's not very responsibly forest, forested, but if scraps show up, I'm not above using it. Um, and then I'm just going to throw out some other like cool woodworking things that are options out there. So there's steam bending. So steam bending is where you steam a piece of wood, preferably green wood, and then you can literally bend it. So this is, I was working on a project making wooden handlebars for a bicycle. So I was took wood and literally heated it up and then bent it. And so the wood is just sort of like collapsing here and staying the same here. Um, so this is pretty, I mean, it's a big old chunk of oak. So it's pretty remarkable that you can do this. So if people are interested, we could do videos on steam bending. That's kind of cool. There's marquetry, which is taking little pieces of wood and uh, burning them and whatnot and to make designs. So that's, marquetry is pretty cool. Um, um, yeah, so let's see. I mean, I'm just gonna look at the questions again and see the other things people are interested in. Is, is there anything that people want me to hit more on that I missed? Uh, cool, so why might we use green wood? So green wood for let's say turning. So normally in woodworking, the piece of wood is stationary and the tool is moving. And with turning, the a uh, piece of wood is spinning on the, a tool called the lathe, and then your tool that, that you're holding in your hand is pretty stationary, moving along, cutting it. Um, so that's good for, for making chess pieces and table legs and chair legs and all sorts of fun things. Um, and um, uh, but, 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 yeah, so for green wood, you oftentimes it's better to turn green wood. Um, because it's just much easier to cut. Uh, and But the problem is it still has a tendency to crack. So oftentimes what a professional wood turner will do is they'll turn like 10 bowls out of green wood just to hog out most of the material, leave them in the garage for a year while they, the wood dries, and half of them will crack, and those get tossed. And then the other half have already had most of their wood removed, and then you can just finish them like doing the fine details, getting it down exactly how you like. Um, now that it's dried and harder and more difficult to work with. So that's one example when you want to use green wood and others for steam bending wood. Um, there are, for whittling can be nicer. Uh, it's generally like slightly easier to cut in some ways. I can't really put into words how. Um, all right, so I think I, I went through the list of things that I had. So if people have any questions, feel free to, to post them. I'll stick around for a few minutes. Um, if not, really glad people came and I'm excited to see what the reviews look like and see if people enjoyed this, if we want to do more, if there are other topics we want to hit on. Um, yeah, yeah and if there's anything right now you want me to hit on more deeply, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I was going to say, since we're sort of at the, the end, maybe we can try uh, if people want to unmute and ask in voice if we yeah. haven't done all of the, uh, all the chats. So people should feel free to jump in and ask a voice question if they are comfortable. <laughs> a voice question. Cool. All right. No, vo well, no brave voice know. questioners. Yeah, I got one. <laughs> can I uh, can I uh, post a picture on this of uh, some woodwork that I did? from my photo library? Is there a way for me to get that in front of everybody at this point? If it's a link that you share, if it's like in a photo album online or something, you could share the link. Oh, it has to be a link. It just, I just can't paste in a photo then, I guess. Yeah, no, it, it doesn't paste in a photo. You could share your screen would be the way to do it. Okay. All right, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, I Any hope everyone... Others? Relaxing and oops. oh, there's a there's a question. <laughs> um, does anyone make blanks? Do you mean any like people at Make Haven, or can you buy wood turning blanks anywhere? Um, I don't think so. I don't. I, that would be a cool thing for someone to do. So normally we're making wood for making wood turning blanks. Yeah, you'd use a the pressure pot. So you can just stabilize a piece of wood. So let's say I had just a chunk of wood that I liked use a wood stabilizer and put it in the, I, 
well, people have, go crazy, but you can do first the vacuum and then the pressure, or pressure in the vacuum, whatever, maybe not that way. But what that does is it just impregnates the deep into the wood, the stabilizer to harden it up. So oftentimes there'll be punk, which is like rotted wood or something in there that if you put it on the lathe directly, you just blow to pieces, which would be pretty dangerous. So you can stabilize it. And what that does is it makes it like a nice hard piece of wood that doesn't look very different. Alternatively, you can take things and put it in a block of resin just to completely stabilize it, and then you can turn it. So if you're interested in doing that, that would be a really cool thing to, to do. And I'm sure people would be really excited to buy it because that's definitely a stumbling block for the, the lathe is finding material that is interesting to cut. It can be hard to find green wood if you, know, if you don't live around trees, for example. Uh, I don't know what a lumilite is. I'm totally interested. Cool, that's awesome, that'd be really exciting. A, a lumilite is a brand of resin. It's like cool. smooth on. It's just there. Uh, I don't know. I think there's a variety of different resins within it. Nice. Uh, yeah, no, that'd be awesome. The uh, I don't know how if this is exciting to anyone here, but I saw a um, a post earlier today of the famous woodworker who took a bunch of um, he like turns brass on his lathe, which is pretty cool, and then realized that a lot of gun the shells are made out of brass. And so he had a bunch of empty, it's called brass, like the leftover shells from shooting, and he put them in resin and then turned a bowl out of the brass encased in resin, which is, which is pretty cool. Yeah, sweet. Cool. Well, well any other questions? Um, just in case you didn't see it in the chat, uh, please do fill out the evaluation, um, not only for feedback for Lior, but also just we're experimenting with this format and you might have some tips for things that would make it better or easier. Uh, those are valuable because they can impact the future, uh, future online presentations. Um, that link is in the chat. I'll share it again but, uh, in, momentarily. Uh, but other than that, I just want to say uh, thank you to Lior for jumping in and being the first Brave uh, instructor. You betcha. Cool. Well, see everyone soon, virtually or in person. Take care. I'm going to log out now. Bye, guys. Thanks, Lior. Take care.